Hey everyone, Walter Crosby with Helix Sales Development and another episode of Sales and Cigars. Today, uh, our, our old friend Nate is back to, and our, our series of episodes where we had to think about sales. And today, um, we're going to talk about how to think about your social media presence, how to, how to think about the way to post, what you should post, and most importantly, how to, how to talk to your customer and why you should talk to them in a particular way. Um, as usual, Nate's got some great ideas. And if, if you hang to the end or fast forward to the end, um, in the last, last five minutes, there's an exercise that I don't care if you're a visionary leader, this will help you get better at leading your team, understanding your staff, creating a better culture. Um, and, if, and if you're a salesperson or sales manager, this exercise will allow you to get inside of the head of your customer. It's really important as we go into uh, the end of the year with planning and getting ready for 23. It's a really powerful exercise that I, I'm, I really hope you um, take the time and the effort to think about this and to go do it. So go grab a cigar. Go grab a cocktail and get ready to enjoy another strap in. Get ready to enjoy another episode of Sales and Cigars. Thanks. So, Nate, welcome to the program. Appreciate you taking some time to come back and on our, our series of how to think about sales. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Um, just so you know, I've had a, a lot of feedback over the last couple of months from listeners who are consistently listening to like when they don't get enough Nate on a regular basis, they get a little itchy. So um, (laughs) they're, they're enjoying these. uh, Some of them think we geek out, but um, I think it's uh, I I think they're well-received and informative. And what we tried to do is be helpful. And I I think that's happening. So, you know, that's, happening on your side of the screen, not mine. I, I think it comes from both, but uh, appreciate it. Appreciate anybody out there in the audience that appreciates it as well. We're just happy to deliver value and uh, geek out and have people enjoy it. So, so what I thought we could talk about today was, and we've had strategy conversations. We've talked about ways to approach this. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's, your, your ideas are different than what most people do. And the topic is, you know, how to think about social media um, and, and uh, the posts that we do. And, and it, there's change and there's different things with different platforms. But, you know, on a strategic level, um, I think that's where we can talk about what, what salespeople, sales managers, companies, marketing people, how they should be thinking about how they engage with their audience on social media. So let's, let's first talk about the audience. Like how should they be thinking about their audience in your opinion? I think one of the, the biggest things when it comes to social media um, and really any, any platform, whether it's your, your marketing that you're putting out in, mm-hmm. into the market, whether it's emails that are going out to existing customers or people that are, you know, subscribed to a blog blog or anything Mm -hmm. like that or social media it comes down to making sure you have a complete and total understanding of who it is that you're actually communicating with and i think many times what what most people try to do is they they want to get as many people brought into that as possible and what it really should be is more what what dean graziosi taught me which is when you you market to everybody you speak to no one so who's the one perfect person? Who's the one perfect customer for you? And speak to them because the more you speak to them, the more you'll have have other people that are very similar that then want and are attracted to that specific messaging. So Dean Graziosi, Seth Godin talks about having the smallest viable tribe of people, right? Mm -hmm. So what I heard was we need to get really clear about who that, that one person is the, not necessarily the person itself, but the characteristics 
what they like, what they don't like, how they think, what they think about, what they concerns about, what scares them, what what concerns them, what troubles they're going through, how they look at their company, what their what their goals are, mm-hmm. and 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 getting clear on that isn't something that you do in five or ten minutes. It's it's an exercise in and of itself, right? To really dive into that. So, you have any tips on 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 a visionary leader or senior executive to be like, I want more of those guys. So how do I go look at those guys that those are great customers for us? How do you duplicate that? Yeah, I think, I think there's a couple of things that you have to consider. One is the size of the organization that's kind of going through this exercise. Cause the larger the organization gets the, the broader it likely gets from a top down perspective. Right. But if, if you're talking a, a smaller organization, um, one thing in this, this even, you know, we're talking social media, but this even goes into like sales hiring and whatnot. When, when you have that perfect customer that's well-defined, it's not just the industry. It's not just the size of company and things like that. You want to literally get down into the psychographics of how they think, you know, how do they actually process? Um, what types of things are they focused on? Um, from various different perspectives, because that determines who your customer base ends up being. So if you could imagine like the perfect customer base, what makes those individuals, those people unique, right? Um, And the more that you can think about that and you can focus on that, then you can even attract people into the organization that like that type of person, right? That like working with people that have those types of thoughts and that type of mentality. So the more you can kind of build and shape around that, the more you can actually, again, attract the right type of employees to serve those individuals, but the more you can actually speak to them as well from that perspective. So you're speaking to the the ideal client, the dot, the avatar, whatever terminology yep. somebody uses. And if we, you know, we're, we're thinking about that from who we want to work with, who we enjoy working with. Is that fair? Yep, Absolutely. And who we can add real value. Um, so, you know, I can I'll use me as an example. You know, I'm looking to to deal to you know at a high level visionary leaders who are looking to grow, and grow means you know double or triple the next three to five years, and then what do they need to do to fix those things to get there? Um, but I also I'm also looking at things like, and maybe this is what you mean by psychographics, but I I want to deal with people that have similar interests to me mm-hmm. or have interests that I find interesting, but like I don't participate. I'll give you an example. Like I'm a cigar guy. So obviously if somebody's like cigars, it's a cool thing for me, but I'm not a hunter. Mm-hmm. I don't, my family's hunted and, uh, you know, I get it. Um, I enjoy, you know, a nice piece of venison or elk meat. Um, but I don't want to go do it. Mm-hmm. But it, to me, it's like I get really excited in the fall when one of my customers or older or former customers will come to me with a – send me a text with them sitting next to, you know, an animal that they just harvested. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and they, you know, they're all sitting there, all proud, pointing at the the elk or the the deer or whatever. And I, I don't, I don't want to get up early in the morning, go stand out in the cold, and wait for something to walk by to shoot it. I, I don't have a problem with it, but I don't, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. But I, I find it interesting, and I learn a little bit about it, and it gives me some joy to watch watch other people other people do this. So that that would fall into that psychographic is something that I. I enjoy learning about or just like participating in from afar. That's a, is that part of that? Yeah, it certainly can because there's certain, there's certain mindsets, there's certain traits, there's certain attributes about those individuals that are typically going to be decently consistent amongst all hunters, right? It's not saying that everybody's the same, but in order to be into that type of an event, uh, sports is another very, very common one that you can look at, right? Typically, people that enjoy sports have a competitive nature to them. They have um, a love for that. And there's 
pros and cons to that because obviously you can get get rivalries and where you don't want to work with you know i'll just say it but you know the ohio state uh anybody that's come come from there um i'm a, I'm a michigan grad i can work with ohio <laughs> state people i just got to learn to talk more slowly and use monosyllabic <laughs> words now i just said something that's probably offensive to ohio state people but I have five or six really good friends who are Ohio State people. Yep. And I've said that to them. And they, you know, appreciate the sarcasm. And they give me back, you know, shots too. So that's yep. part of the fun of that competitive nature. Yeah. But I could weed people out real fast by saying something like that, that are sensitive. But then again, I don't want to work with people that are overly sensitive. And that's right. right. And and so that's, that's a way of kind of... Um, you know, they, they one of the things that they say from a marketing perspective is that you want to take a firm stance on something and you want to create polarity to a certain extent. And there's wow, look at that. It's a polarity. That's a that's a twenty five cent word. <laughs> uh, uh, Repel and attract. I was going to say I was, I was in the Marines, so don't ask me to define the word polarity. Uh, <laughs> Repel and retract. <laughs> But you want to you want to repel those you want you want or you want to attract those you want and you want to repel those that you don't. Right. And so to bring it back to the social media piece, it's the same thing. Right. So when you're when you're putting messaging out there, when you're making a post, when you're writing content, when you're putting images out, when you're putting video out, whatever that may be. You want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that speaks to those individuals. Right. So if I was Walter and I was putting a video out there, I may start one of the videos that says, Hey, if you're a visionary leader and you're looking to double or triple your company in the next three to five years, and you're between, you know, five and 30 million, these are probably some things that you're dealing with right now that are struggles that you're facing. Well, I just defined those individuals and then let them know, here comes a message for you. So when they listen, it's likely going to have more resonance than if I didn't define that at all and said, hey, you know what? If you're a visionary leader, you're probably struggling with these things. And you may have a visionary leader of a company that's not even doing a million yet going, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have no idea what those problems are. Or if you had Tim Cook, who's a visionary leader, he'd be look, he'd be sitting there going, yeah, we blew past that like eons ago. <laughs> like, we're, we're But it's like, exactly your point, right? That's not my my niche and right. other people aren't my niche and I'm not for everybody. Yep. Right. I'm not everybody's cup of tea and there's nothing wrong with that. We don't have to be all things to all people. In fact, it's harder to be successful. I mean, unless you're selling some widget that consumers want, yep. it's hard to, it's hard to trade that offering. So when, when somebody's thinking about their, their, their post, on and we'll just keep it simple right you got linkedin you got instagram you got facebook you have uh, uh tiktok is that real it is, is that apparently thing? yep um so let, we'll keep it simple with linkedin and there's there's ways to write up your posts because what you just what you just did off the cuff was to define who i was i was talking to so they either pay attention or don't. They can deselect out. But they might stick around and listen to the message, but they're either in or they're out, really. Mm-hmm. And and then for the people that that I am talking to, that they're they're in, they're leaning in, right? So we can do that with words. We can do that with video. Can can we do that with like imagery or animation? Is that all part of this too? Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of different posting frameworks that you can get into when it comes to actually the writing of the post or the creation of the post. But I don't care whose framework you, you look at, they're all going to basically tell you that the number one most important thing is the hook, right? It's the thing that grabs people's attention. Some people call it a grabber. Some people call it a hook. There's different names for it, but it's, it's really that thing that gets someone to stop their scroll. So, if you think about it, the average attention span across the globe right now for adults is about 1.7 seconds. So they're going to be on their phone and they're going to be scrolling, 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 scrolling. You could have just a big, massive red box that stops them from scrolling, has nothing on it. It's just a red box. And then in very tiny lettering 
has arrows pointing down at the bottom that says, read this, that could be enough because it takes up so much space in the scroll and it's, it's massive and people just don't expect a big red square that they go, oh, wait, what, what is that? The- so it's sort of like, like how I was taught the cold call years and decades ago mm-hmm. is that we need to interrupt the pattern of whoever we're, we're, we're reaching. Yep. And that's the same principle here. We're, same we're principle. interrupting that silly, just thumb scrolling through um, mindless mm-hmm. to get them to like, what, what was that? Yep. And that can be done ethically. That can be done with poor taste. Um, and we're, we're not recommending that we're recommending that you, you do something that's different, that is, does grab their attention, but in a way that is, how would you describe that unique without being offensive? Yeah. So you want it like there's there, I think the way to look at it is, um, there's obviously gimmicky things that grab people's attention, right? To be frank, you could show up naked on camera and it's going to grab people's attention. Probably not the safest thing for your career. Probably not the safest thing for the people you're trying to attract because probably ain't going to last too long. So I'm not going to comment on yeah, that. Yeah, no, so. no need to comment on that one. But that would grab people's attention, right? There's a reason you don't see people doing that most of the time. On the social media platforms that we're talking about. Correct. Yes, because you'll get censored and everything else. Um but when you when you think about just that grabbing of the individual, the the main thing that actually grabs someone atten- someone's attention, whether it's the first line in in the post, whether it's the image, whether it's the the first line coming out of your mouth in a in a video, is resonance. So the only way that you're going to actually resonate with the person that's reading that, that's going to get them to stop in the middle of a scroll and go, oh wait, I got to read that because that that sounded like it was talking to me is you have to know and understand that person. That's why when you try to speak to a broad, broad audience, people just scroll right by because it's not for them. It's for anybody that fits in that massive bucket, and that could be anybody. They don't feel special by that. So they just keep, oh, that's just, you know, okay, whatever. What gets them to stop is something that actually resonates. So the more you can get inside the mind of your customer, the more you can use phrases that they're using themselves um, saying things that they might be saying to their spouse across the kitchen table or saying something that they might be saying in a boardroom, talking to the you know, CEOs, talking to the CFO or the CRO, and he says, hey, here's the major issue that we're dealing with. When you can figure out what those phrases are by getting inside the mind of the customer and thinking, what, what conversations are they actually having already? And how do I enter that conversation in the midst of it and say, hey, right now, you're probably wondering how X, Y, Z is going to affect the economy and how that's going to affect your ability to hit your growth numbers in 2023. Let me tell you a little something about that. And then you go into whatever your post is about that information. So if somebody's doing, and I think that's helpful is that you, we, you know, kind of summarize where we are. We're, we want to be different. Mm -hmm. We want to be uh, strong in a position. We don't want to be, it's okay to be comfort, um, uh, non-conventional, but we don't want to go too far into a gimmicky thing that makes us feel like kind of schlocky or sleazy, but, but being different enough in a positive way, mm-hmm. that's creative. Um, but, 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 but speaking to that individual, and that's how we should look at it. We're speaking to an individual, not the masses, mm-hmm. and that we can get to that individual by knowing what they're talking about, what they're thinking about. And sometimes we can just talk to our good customers. Like, you know, what are you, what are you talking about with your other CEO friends or senior executive friends? What do you, what's, what's the hot button? What are you guys concerned about besides A and B? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, and then it's just when we are talking to people listening really well, Right. Not just listening for and you had this in one of your posts the other day, not just listening to what they're saying, but what they're not saying. Mm -hmm. Right. Is really important. What what are they leaving out of the conversation for different reasons? But what are they leaving out and 
And that leads us to asking other questions and things, but it, it helps us create questions to ask on on social media. So, I mean, I think we're, we, we're, we've got a, some context for a different approach, a different strategy. Mm-hmm. So is there any rules of thumb around the length of a post, the length of a, um, a video? Because you can have a topic that you can, you can write a blog post about, you can write a book about, you can mm-hmm. write a, a little article. It's like, what's, is there any rules of thumb there that you found that are helpful? Um, so yes and no. I mean, there's, there's certain things depending on the platform that you're referring to that there's rules that come into play, right? So like, for instance, everybody's trying to compete with TikTok right now. And so TikTok videos are typically 60 seconds or less. So YouTube came out with YouTube shorts, Instagram and Facebook have reels. Um, those are the things that from an algorithmic perspective, they're pushing right now. Um, and so they want to attract more people to put that type of content. So they're going to push those posts out to the masses more than they would anybody else. So you'll see right now in my social content strategy, which I didn't come up with myself, I got it from a mastermind, uh, event that I was at from, from mastermind.com and the team there, but I'm pushing a lot of reels right now because they're 60 seconds. They're short, they're hard hitting. Um, there's a hook, there's a little message, a little story in it because they're so short, I don't necessarily have to have a call to action at the end of it. Um, but that information is short, it's compact, it's hard hitting, and it's a single topic that I can talk about. However, and, and, let me I'm going to interrupt for just a second to make a point. Yeah, we're not, we're not trying to sell them something every time we do something on social media. It, no. I mean, I think that, no. that point's got to be made clear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like, there's, there's different rules of thumb. So like email marketing, you have a rule of thumb for how often you should actually be quote unquote selling. It's about 85 to 15. So 85% of the time you should be just pouring value through the email. And then 15% of the time you can get away with, um, you can get away with actually selling through the email, social media. It's about 90, 10. 90% 90% of the time you want to be delivering value and there's different frameworks for how you structure the value that you provide. So there's consistency amongst it, but it's about 90, 10, um, text messaging is about the same text is, is more like 95, five, uh, from that perspective, uh, because text messaging is usually much, much shorter in its, in its complex or in its capability and what you're going to be texting people. Um, but there's rules of thumb around that. The, the main thing is that a lot of people look at social and they hear the information of how much money can be made through social media. So people go into social thinking, oh, cool, I'm going to put this strategy out there. I'm going to get flooded with leads and I'm going to sell like crazy to all my customers. The reality is... I'm sorry for laughing. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's a belief that people have. A, but the, the reality is it's a social channel and it, it, it goes back to the age old thing that, um, you know, they teach you in like early days of sales training. You don't just walk up to someone and say, Hey, will you marry me? Right. You court them for a little while. You date them, you get to know their likes and their dislikes and, you know, figure out if you're the right fit for each other and all that kind of stuff. For some reason, people forgot that rule when they went into social and they thought you could just drop into someone's inbox and, you know, pitch them and on LinkedIn all day. Um, you have to build a relationship. But but by now that's, Everybody knows that. Everybody should know that, I guess. But at the <laughs> same time, the tens of tens of no, not according to my know. inbox. No, <laughs> like I, I, I do when I accept an invitation or a connection request on LinkedIn. Sometimes I do it thinking five minutes, ten minutes, mm-hmm. maybe twenty four hours, right? And I and I try to guess before they come back with a pitch, mm-hmm. right? And Sometimes it's it's their autoresponder or their whatever their little system is. Mm-hmm. It doesn't even wait five minutes. No, it just immediately. The I reason say, I was, sometimes I it's barely even five seconds. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I just delete those people. So anybody that's trying to pitch me in a in a, I'm fine with connecting with people. If if they're true to what they originally say, like, Hey, I thought we could, you know, maybe help each other. It'd be good to connect. I'd love to look at your feed or blah, blah, blah. Yep. And then, you know, a week later, they're like, I saw this post that you did that was interesting. 
okay, that's not that's not pitching, and and it's not um, it, it's not on autopilot, right? It's not IA or AI, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody's actually thinking. Right. Um, Dave Brock wrote a great article um, a couple months ago where he ex- it literally told people how to pitch him and how he would listen and how to get a meeting. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I'm not worried about it because nobody's going to Nobody, do it. Nobody's going to do it. Exactly. <laughs> nobody's going to pay attention to it. Yeah. And, but it, I mean, but how he, how he would take a meeting is exactly how most people would like you're delivering, you, you know, something about me. You've done a little bit of research. You understand my business and understand what I'm about. You under, you think you understand what my problems might be. And you're, you're offering to have a conversation that might add value to me yep. without a pitch. Yep. Okay. If people spent 15, 20 minutes doing that, rather than just putting the send button every, you know, keep pushing the send button on emails mm-hmm. cold, life would be a whole lot better for everybody. I, so, I agree. so those rules of thumb, 60 seconds on a video. What about the posts? I mean, it's the same format, right? Speak to them, hit them hard about what that hook is, and then give them a little bit of a story that helps them understand that you really do get what they're struggling with. Yep. And sometimes there's a, a quote-unquote call to action. But that call to action could be just like, hey, go think about this. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, I, I'm happy to have a conversation, but it's it's more about this, go think and reflect and journal on this, whether this is really something that is, is a bigger problem and, and encourage them to just try to contemplate it for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, you always want some kind of call to action, um, for something that's a little bit longer. Right. And so we, we talked about a couple of the things that have some immediate structure around them as far as just like, you can only do 60 seconds on reels and and things like that. The, The one thing to keep in mind is that there's, um, uh, what's the right phrase that I want to use here? Um, you, you want to think of it as like capital that you have at a bank, right? So Jocko Willink does a really good job where he talks about leadership capital. And he talks about how so many times people are making withdrawals and they haven't put anything into the bank. They haven't invested. So they don't have any leadership capital to actually draw on. But the great leaders don't ever just tell you to go do something. They build up that leadership capital over time so that when they do say, hey, this needs to get done, can you go and do it? You don't even ask. You just go, yeah. And it's 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 not a drain on the system because it's it's so few and far in between. Well, it's very similar in the sense of when you're building social media and you're putting content and you're putting information out there and you're putting out value, right? There's a certain amount of every time you make an ask, you're pulling value back out of the system. You're asking for value to come back to you, right? So right. There's there's a certain level of kind of thinking of it from that mental imagery perspective. Of Just the- from a financial perspective, like right, if you you keep making withdrawals from your bank account without making deposits, uh, math sort of subtracts and subtract and subtract. You're 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 gonna you're gonna be hosed. Mm-hmm. You're gonna get that o- overdrawn thing. And but I I think it's I think your point is that there should always be a large balance in your social media account or your leadership account or your management manager, you know, account of having that capacity there, that, um, that value. And, and, and you create that by giving. Right. Right. Sharing. You create that by giving and sharing and adding value back to the market. But when you're first starting off, when nobody knows who the heck you are, the first question in someone's mind is, why should I read this person's post, right? There's no credibility. You haven't built up any credibility capital, so to speak. So when you first start off, as far as like a general rule of thumb, short and hard hitting is best. The shorter, the better, because you, you need to take some time to build up where there's value in people reading your content. So if you go out there and you just start putting out blog posts or you just start going, okay, what's the limit on LinkedIn? I can get away with 600 characters or whatever it is. I'm going to go with, you know, 599 characters to get this thing in. You haven't built up enough capital for people to even read your stuff at that point. So having general thumb is- got to earn it. Right. Until you've earned that right, you go shorter 
just generally from a content perspective. Um, and you, you build up that right of people saying, okay, there was value there. There's value there. You get a couple likes, a couple comments, things like that. And then you continue adding, adding value. It's a, um, it, it's, it's continually giving, trying to build credibility, mm-hmm. trying to be helpful. Uh, I mean, there is an end game here. We are trying to win um, from a sales perspective, but I think the difference is that, at least how you and I think, is that we're trying to create wins for the customer, for ourselves, and and for the community in general, right? We want we want to elevate all of that. Mm-hmm. And if we we're a good citizen on social media and we're modeling the behaviors that we want other people to model, you know, we can look back and like you know, that's awful behavior, um, and and we can feel good about it. It just validates every time I get one of those. Like I'm not doing that, mm-hmm. and it's such a terrible way to go about it. Um, it, it just validates what, what we're doing and gives you a little bit of motivation to keep um, keep on keeping on because mm-hmm. um, it is a long game. And, and every once in a while, something something weird pops. Somebody, you know, something pops out of the, the woodwork. Like I, um, I did, had a post today about nothing about business at all. Mm-hmm. It was about traditions that I've created with um, family and traditions with Bob, take this out um, or Brendan, please take that out. Um, so go back to where he can cut this. So oh, oh, a thing that happened today was I, I, I did a post on LinkedIn about traditions and things that I've created in my family and things with my daughter. And it was about my daughter. It was a picture of my daughter sitting across from a birthday cake that they had made for me. It was a weird birthday cake. It looked like a cheeseburger. Um, and But it was about the traditions that I've created with her and her hobby. She was an, she's an equestrian. And then the things that we've done, uh, I did with her as a young, young girl, and that we still do to this day, just when we're in Florida, it's like, Hey, let's, you want to go grab breakfast tomorrow? And we just went out the two of us. Like we always do is at, over at some point when she comes home, we're like, she asks, can we go grab breakfast? And, and it's just a way for us to connect. It's a tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how is that going to resonate with anybody? Right. But Dave Curlin commented on my post, like, this res literally said this resonated with me because he created those traditions with his son um, around baseball, mm-hmm. um, and he has tons of traditions in his family. Right, they always go to the Nutcracker at Christmas time, and right, it, it, we all do it. But I did it with intent. So long winded way of saying I didn't I didn't know what was going to happen. I was just trying to be personal. Mm-hmm. So every once in a while. It's good to share something where you have a little vulnerability. Is that is that fair on social media? Absolutely. Not like not like weepy and you know terrible stories or anything like that, but um, but something that that that's a share. And, and frankly, the last couple of posts where I've done that with about a relationship that I have with my daughter, mm-hmm. the number of likes and engagement with those posts are through the roof. Yeah, and the thing is, it it people connect with people, right? So, so one of the main things to remember with that exact type of thing is, it's good to share something personal. It's good to share something that other people can connect with. You know, you have Dave Curlin connecting on the traditions that he's created with his son around baseball. You're gonna have other people that connect with that that are connecting, going, "I want that. I didn't do those things," or "I'm a young dad. I've got you know Emma Smiley who's just turned two. And I'm trying to figure out, like, what are the things that I can make sure that I do so that I'm around and I'm creating those traditions with her, right? She and I have a tradition that when soccer is on, football, we turn it on, and she's now to the point where the World Cup's on. So every once in a while, I'll pop up for lunch and I'll turn the TV on, which isn't something we normally do during the day. And the first thing she does is, goal! And I'm like, yes, but we don't want Spain to win. Like, come on. Um, 
So right. sorry, Spain. You but but that's that's the makings of a tradition. She's a two year old little person that's trying to absorb the world around her. Yep. But here's here's the thing. The things that that she's observing, especially her, mm-hmm. right? Because she is very observant. She is. Right? She might not verbalize every little thing, but she's paying attention. Mm-hmm. And she's hearing things that are being said and done. And those good and bad come back at you mm-hmm. later on. Yep. Um, it, and it, that becomes really important in that like four to eight, like where they're like, you know, Dad, I heard you say the other night when we were at dinner about blah blah blah. I'm like, shit. <laughs> right? Yep. And 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 you know, I just have to I have to pay attention, but but building those little those little pieces, mm-hmm. those little traditions that, that you can layer on, especially if it's something that I mean, she was passionate about horses and riding and going to you know um uh horse shows. I'm allergic to horses. Mm. I don't want to buy a horse. I, 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 it just wasn't something I wanted to do, but it was, she loved it. And she's, it, it, it was a thing that I did. Like I would, like she would get be getting ready to go into the ring and I'm like, I'm going to be over there. Mm-hmm. And I would be sitting over there with a cigar and a beverage out of the way. And she knew where I was. And when she got in the ring, she would look to make sure I was there. And then she did her thing, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, I mean, we just, we had our, our, our ways of doing that. And she wanted us to be there. She didn't want to deal with us every minute of every day. Mm-hmm. But she wanted us there to, to and she appreciated it. it it's all really um, um, stuff that we can control. Sorry. Um Brendan can take that out too. Uh, so, I, I think there's a, I, I think there's a, a a way to build those traditions and, and and create create that vulnerability on social media and share those ideas that just make us make like you said make connections as as people. Yeah, I think that's really really important because we're. It's not just business, like because especially with what we do, we get we get in relationships with people. Yep. And you, you sometimes it feels like therapy, but um, you know it's part of the deal. Mm-hmm. Got to help. Yeah, so. and that that level of personal ability, personability is completely different than um, what you see some people doing, which is they're they're going to share a picture of their meal that they had every flipping day to say that they went to subway today or whatever. That's, that's not creating a level of personability unless it's something that it's tied to. Uh, like I used to do, uh, where I would put a picture of my workout every morning. I would put a picture of something that I was doing related to my workout. Well, it was a collage. Yeah, it was. And it was like the whole reason I started doing that is because I had, I stopped at one point and I had someone that actually reached out to me and said, Hey, that was really motivating that I knew your post was going to be there. And that kept me going to the gym. So I was like, okay, I'll keep doing it. So, um, sometimes that's, that's good. That's okay. But the thing is just making sure that it's personable and it's not you just putting stuff out there just for the sake of blah, of just being like, Oh yeah, I had pizza today. Cool. Like no one cares. Yeah. The old Facebook BS. Yeah. Um, and there's no reason to be argumentative no, in, in social media. And it's okay to have a difference of opinion, but there's no reason to be a dick about, right? right? And you, you can share your thought, but don't tell somebody they're wrong without saying, that's interesting perspective. Um, I, I've come to, my experience has taken me to this perspective, right? And mm-hmm. and just, you know, not being rude about it. Yep. and. But it's okay to be controversial sometimes, as long as you're not, you know. Um, as as I have a client who who is who's like, you know, I don't have a problem with somebody disagreeing with me, and I don't have a problem with somebody that wants to challenge the way we do things. I just don't want to work with assholes. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had a real clear definition um, that that people that just couldn't have a conversation about it. Mm-hmm. So, um, all right, any. Anything that we should that we didn't talk about that we should hit here as we as we wrap up for social media ways to think about it. You know, this is probably something we could do a whole 
uh, whole podcast in and of itself, but one of the most helpful things that uh, I got out of the, the mastermind event that I was at, there, there was a gentleman there who, who came up and presented to us uh, named Jesse Ecker. And um, he shared with us the idea. He challenged all of us at one point. He said, uh, you know, could you write a journal entry from the perspective of your ideal client? And he shared how one of the things that he'll do is he'll take a journal and he'll go on a hike. And he goes, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's three hours, you know, however long it takes. But he'll write a journal entry from the perspective of his client. And you and I talked about that the other day of how powerful it would be if an exercise for a salesperson was to literally write a journal entry from the perspective of their client. And I think what for me is actually the even more powerful thing is to write it and then actually share it and find a customer of yours that you're decently well connected with and say, Hey, so I'm, I'm trying out this exercise and you know, it's kind of goofy. It's kind of silly, but I'm trying to write a journal ent- uh, entry from the perspective of a client. And so I wrote this and you know, you're a CEO. I wrote this thinking of a CEO that was in this position. How accurate would this be? Like, like, is there anything in here that just, it's like, nah, that would never happen. Or, you know, some of it I'm, I'm writing it as if it's a journal entry. So I'm writing it with, you know, I woke up today and blah, 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 blah type thing. But, you know, is, is this really, did I capture the feelings? Did I capture the emotions? Did I capture that thing? And, and what's them, missing? Let them give you feedback and let them go, well, nah, you're way off here. This, this doesn't even cross my mind, but this this I'm thinking about every single day because now when you think about entering the mind of the customer, you've got it. <laughs> like, and you can, because you literally up. tried to get in their head yeah, and, and think about it. And then you've taken it to the next level. So I, I I've, I've done that exercise mm-hmm. um, with a couple of people in mind, a couple of clients in mind. And I, I have a meeting in about two weeks to share this because I don't want to just send it to them and like make it a thing. I want to like, yeah. I, I want to go over this with you. I want, I want you to understand the context and then I give it to them mm-hmm. and then kind of come back with it. I think it'll be powerful, but, but I'm going to present it in the way that this is what I'm doing to try to get into your head and to more people like you because mm-hmm. I enjoy working with you. Yep. But let me explain this to you, what I did. and You tell me if it's wrong, but what if you did this for your people? What if you got your people to do this and you just took a couple hours one day and everybody got together and shared their thoughts about who they think their people are, mm-hmm. how they think? Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a brilliant idea uh, that, that um, Jesse came up with that you're, that you're generously sharing. Um, and I, and I think that's just something right right there at the end of this podcast. I mean, that's that could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to salespeople if they really took the time to do that, plan for it, and then like, execute on it in next year, um, and use that for social media, use that for how to converse, have conversations with their prospects during discovery, and and just how to think about empathetically Mm -hmm. your customers. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you think about it from the position of a sales leader, let's say you had a team of five salespeople and you asked them to go through that exercise and then you reviewed what they wrote, you would instantaneously know my salespeople understand our buyer or they have no idea about our buyer's (laughs) world whatsoever. Right. Caveat emptor though, because uh, (laughs) that could be like, holy crap, they got no idea what they're doing. Well, but that that tells you something, right? I mean, how many it how does. many times does does a sales consultant get hired to go in and help with messaging around how the how the salesperson should be communicating with the buyer? And if you just did that exercise, you could set an immediate baseline for where the team is at. Immediate baseline, right? Um, not only that, but then think about um, the empathy of everybody. Like, think about doing that as a leader. Because um, I, I I challenged someone that I know that's a CEO. Um, and I said, Hey, I want to challenge you to take this exercise. I'm kind, I'm kind of going off on a tangent on what, what Jesse taught, but I said, I want you to take this exercise and actually do it from the different positions within your company. So write that journal entry from the position of 
your chief marketing officer, from the position of your CRO, from the position of your field salesperson that's out on the street every day and everything else. He said, write that from the perspective of the dock worker that's loading the truck. And when I just had them mentally go through that, he went, Nate, I, I don't think I could write it for everybody. And I said, okay. And how does that affect your ability to lead those people? And he goes, Communicate with them. massive. So even just using it from that perspective can be huge. So, yeah, there's a ton, there's a ton of value there. So, um, let, let's, let's land it there. Um, as always, um, it's fun having conversations with you because we, we went off in one direction and, and we, we, we weaved our way through social media, but coming back, it's, it, it all ties it back. Really understanding who those people are, who our customer really is. And it's not just like the CEO of a manufacturing company. Okay. That is nowhere near where you're, you're not done. Yep. Right. So Barely you got another couple hours worth of work. <laughs> yeah. You're not even, you're not even, you haven't scratched the surface yet. It's got a tough coat on it. You're, you're still just, you're still just looking at it. So, um, I love it. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, um, until, uh, we get, get one of these again here, we're trying to do these once a month and we're going to continue that tradition. Uh, we might release, uh, one of these, uh, special holiday edition, um, cause we're recording this before Christmas 22. Um, I think this one might be, we might bump up and to try to get it out while people are drinking their eggnog and, and, and a festive mood to get them th thinking about 2023. Thanks, Nate. Appreciate yep. it. Thank you. To get your copy of Walter Crosby's new book, The Seven Critical Mistakes CEOs Make With Their Sales Organization That Stop the Company From Scaling, follow the link in the show notes or go to Amazon.com. Thank you for listening to Sales and Cigars with Walter Crosby of Helix Sales Development. For more on Sales and Cigars, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Sales and Cigars, produced by thepodcastproshop.com.